Glad to be here with you as we're hurtling towards Easter. Um, I wanted to use Psalm 33 and do a study in here that talks about us focusing on and, and understanding some things about God that give us give us a grounds, a basis for praising and thanking God for all that he's done. And of course, Easter itself, the resurrection of Jesus Christ stirs thankfulness in those who have been born again in Christ Jesus. But I want to talk to you about this psalm, and I think there's some really, really good stuff here. Let's uh, pray, and then we'll dig into it. Lord, we thank you for this, your word. We thank you that you care about what goes on with us. We thank you that what you have done and are doing is still good. And we bring you praise, and we bring you thanks, and we say, Lord, help us to realize the greatness of you and all that you've done, and expand our ability to appreciate all about you. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Psalm 33. In getting into this, consider. We're hurtling through space on a spinning ball, making, marking time as we travel. We circle this fireball at the center of our solar system at 67,000 miles an hour. Our year-long circuit is marked by seasons, and time spools out behind us while we race into what will yet be. In North America, we're rapidly approaching the moment when our uh, journey will get us to the place and a tilt of our planet will result in equal amounts of sunlight and darkness during the day as we spin, and it's called the vernal or spring equinox. And then the first Sunday following the first full moon after that equinox is the Sunday that we celebrate Easter. The, the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In our study of Psalm 33, we began looking, and in, in the first five verses, it tells us that we've, we've been called to make a resounding shout to the Lord for joy, for thankfulness for what he's done. And he calls on the righteous ones to turn up the music and be thankful for God's steady, never-failing love and all of his wonders. And the things that he has done around us, his loving kindness never fails. So when we get into verses 6 through 9, it tells us that it is this living God who set our world on its journey. Yet he made it to feel to us as if it's solid, stable, and dependable. And it all came about by his word. Verse 6 through 9 says this. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, by the breath of his host, of his mouth all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. All right, we're going to unpack this a little bit and understand it's not going to get real technical. Just think about these things. He spoke the world into existence. When you start in Genesis 1, it tells us, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And it goes through, and he, he called forth the dry land. He called forth, the gathered the seas together in one place. And as it tells you, this all became, became in existence through his word. He spoke it to be so. In John 1, 1 through 3, it says this, In the beginning was a word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him nothing was made that he did not make. This is the word of the Lord. This is God the Son speaking the world into existence. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. When it talks about the heavens being made, it means the heavens and everything that occupies it. Verse 6 goes on. And we look out and we, we, uh, we realize that all this came about from his breath. Well, he spoke it and he sent forth his spirit and made it so. All of their host, it says. The heavens were made and all their host by the breath of his mouth. When it talks about a host... God is called the Lord of hosts. And when it talks about the host, it means the vast number. 
It's, the word can be used for armies or troops or or large gatherings. And what it's, it's pointing out is the stars and the created planets and, and, and the galaxies. And the more we see of it, the James Webb, te Webb Telescope points out and we see a, more and more and more and bigger and bigger and countless numbers of these these galaxies, let alone each galaxy containing countless um, planets and, and stars and, and, and parts to them. And what it is telling us is that the more we see, the bigger we see, it's so that our estimation of God will grow. It's not to make it go out there so you say, oh, nobody could keep track of that. Well, no, none of us could. But God did and can. And so as a result of that, we're called to appreciate for our wonder and awe of God to grow as we discover the great volume of all he's made. There's truly no one like him. And the longer you know him, the more you learn of him, the bigger he becomes in our thinking. Verse 7, Psalm 33. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deeps in storehouses. When it when I think about this, where it says that he gathers the water together as a heap, we think about water in a puddle and it's flat looking and, and stuff. But we lived for years down on Iliam the lake here in Alaska. And the lake was so huge that if you stood on the store on, on the shore on one side and looked straight across, you couldn't see the immediate beat. You'd see up a little ways because it looked like the water was heaped up between you and the far side. And the curve of the earth made it so it looked like a mound of water between you and there. And when this says he 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 gathers the waters of the sea together in a heap, I was in the Navy. I was at sea a lot and watched the curve of the earth. And when something would be out of sight beyond the curve of just water, and then as it came into view, you'd steam towards it, and it would gradually rise up, and you'd soon see what it was that you were going towards. It was an amazing thing. So the, this water really is heaped so that it, it has the curve to it that the earth has. But it goes on to say, he gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deeps in storehouses. And I was reading a while back, that there is a body of water, a layer of water near the core of our earth that is so massive that there's more water in it than all of the oceans on the surface of our earth. And it, it's it's down there and it's part of the water core, the water center of what God has made here. That's truly interesting. But the reason we're learning about these, the reason we find out in this is to inspire in us what it talks about in verse 8. It says, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. When you see this, and it says to fear the Lord, we sometimes get distracted by words. We get to the place where we think, well, fear, you know, being scared of something. And, and we've got it, so we've, we've hammered it into what we think it means. But in this verse, to fear the Lord and to stand in awe of him are synonyms. And you mean the exact same thing. And what it is trying to tell us is, here in the U.S., we use the term, something is awesome, again and again. This is awesome. Oh, that's awesome. We don't mean awesome, because the real truth of that word means that something strikes such awe that you're, you're gobsmacked. You can't, you can't handle this. It's too big for you to grasp. To be truly in awe is to be so struck by how mighty, how beyond any other known thing, how massively holy, how so much more than anything else that exists God is, that it strikes us deeply. It's almost to the level of sheer fright when we realize we're dealing with something that's scary huge, scary holy, scary, big. And it's just the beginning of acknowledging who, is he, who he is. Uh, Proverbs 9 and verse 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. To understand in awe the person of God is to begin wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So it says, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. This is saying, 
if you truly begin to get a picture of who God is to grasp this one with whom we are dealing, you're struck with awe. You're struck with how great he is and how small we are in comparison. But then you go on to verse 9. And here's what it says strikes awe in us. This is what causes us to fear, to have awe of the Lord. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. By his very word, he made it happen. A, f a person is wondering, well, if God is so awesome, truly awesome, if God strikes fear in the heart of one who thinks they could stand up to him and realizes there's no way, then why does he pay any attention to us? And that's an interesting thing because the word of God asks the same question. Psalm 8, verses 3 and 4 says, When I consider thy heavens and the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which you have appointed or fixed in place, what is man that you thought of him or the son of man that you care for him? He says, why, why did you think about us at all? If you're so huge, so so beyond anything we can grasp, why are you paying attention to little old us? Psalm 119, verses 89 to 91 says, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Your faithfulness continues throughout all generations. You establish the earth and it stands. They stand this day according to your ordinances or your laws. For all things are your servants. He is the one who is in charge. And again, by his word, it stands and is solid. And we can depend on what he has called to be. Colossians 1, 16 and 17. For in him, all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, we have people speculating all the time. Are there other dimensions? Are there other things where there's living beings that we have never seen? Absolutely. It's called the spiritual realm. And in that and in here, there are beings created on different levels of authority of different different aspects that are that are incredible. And it says, all of these things, visible or invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. He maintains it so that it keeps going, so that it does hold together, so that it doesn't collapse on itself, so that this creation truly made to sustain life was made to be so because he chose it so. And you see that again in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11. Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. He chose by his own volition and will to create and make what we see, what we experience, what goes on. And <clears throat> when you're studying through the word of God, what you begin to see is that his creation of the world, his beginning of all that exists, his claim of ownership because he made it all, is the foundation on which the whole rest of the story is made. And not only did he create it, he knew where it was going. He knew people would rebel against him. He knew that they would be totally lost unless he did something aggressive and huge to save them from the fate that we headed for ourselves. And that death and that separation from him, he chose to, by an act of his grace, grace meaning we didn't deserve it and he didn't have to do it, by his own choice, he sent his son to live and die here and pay the high penalty for our rebellion against him so that we could have life eternal and live with him in the paradise of God that he has made. We're moving toward the Easter celebration. And what this is, is us recognizing the very means by which he did what I was describing. It reminds us that we 
recognize God's creative power and work, not just the creative power in all the bigness that we see around us, but his creative power in dealing with individuals, in saving them, in loving people as persons and caring what happens to them and providing a salvation for them to find him. And actually, this psalm is going to get really into that in a little while. So we're going to continue with Psalm 33 as we go. But for right now, let's just stop and think about the world that he's spoken to be, the stars and the galaxies and all that we are made aware of more and more as we look at the pictures that come back from the big telescopes and we understand how vast and massive and huge and what a project it was. And yet God pays attention to every detail and holds it all together and makes it so that it operates to sustain our lives here. What a blessing it is. We have plenty of means right here, plenty of reason to thank and praise God. And as we head towards the Easter season, we're seeing not only did he provide for us like someone might provide food for a pet, Instead of that, he provided for us on a personal level as persons whom he loves and through Christ reached out in love to us to provide for us life eternal. What a blessing that is. Let's pray for a moment. Lord, we thank you for the kindnesses that you've already shown to us. We thank you that in Christ we have life eternal if we put our faith and trust and confidence in you and in the gift that you've given through your son. We're thankful for what we experience here on this earth. The things that you made here are wonderful. Sometimes they're messed up by people. There's a lot of the places in the world where some are being being uh, brutal to others and mistreat. Sin goes that way. It's what happens when the adversary of our souls tears up what God has made. Help us, O oh Lord, that our minds and hearts would be drawn to the Savior and with thankfulness that we bow to you and say every bite of sweet fruit, every blessing of warm sun, every snowball that we make and throw at someone, every every drink of clear water, these things are from God, are blessings that you have given. We give you praise, we give you thanks, we give you honor, and in awe we say, how could you have done so much for us? Let us walk in gladness for it. Thank you. Guide us in it as you lead us toward our celebration of the resurrection of your son. Praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Be thankful. There's lots of reasons to. There's much to see. Read through Psalm 33. Continue on ahead. And as we talk about it, understand the working of God and see how it shows how hugely filled with grace he is in loving and caring for us. And when we come together, we'll talk about it some more. God bless you till next time.